What's up, everybody? Energy is Love Podcast, Energy is Love Podcast.com, Facebook, Energy is Love Podcast. You guys know it. Go out and subscribe to our show. We absolutely love all of our listeners and we'd appreciate any love and support you could give us because it helps the podcast grow and expand. For the last several weeks, we've been traveling around the country. We were up in Portland for the float conference. Uh, now we're down in San Jose, California. We just recently sat down with Jessica Nidefer here in San Jose. She's a sound healing and energy practitioner, does a lot of amazing things. So that episode will be coming out here in the next little while. Thank you for your patience when it comes to uploading and releasing new episodes we've just been so incredibly busy and by we i mean me if you haven't already go to our facebook page and check out some of the live videos that we've done we were on the streets of portland interviewing and talking to people about energy and floating and all sorts of different things and it was a really fun experience so go check out those live videos that was a really good time kind of a live on the spot on the location episode of the podcast a little mini episode go find the podcast anywhere and everywhere that podcasts are available and share it that's always the challenge that's always the thing we like to throw out there if you enjoy the show tell somebody about it tell your friends tell your family share the podcast so that everybody can bask in the glory of all of this wonderful amazing stuff this episode is brought to you by our sponsors as above so below is an amazing metaphysical shop located in roy utah We've talked about them before. Remember, you can contact them at 801-721-1344. Go to Facebook, find their Facebook page. We've also got links to it on our website. Go check them out. It's a great place. It's a great spot. Lots of really, really cool things available at As Above, So Below. This coming Friday, September 2nd, As Above, So Below is having a coffee gathering discussion about herb magic. It's a great opportunity to learn more about the importance of herbs and how you can incorporate them into your spiritual practices and energy healing, different aspects, all that kind of stuff. So remember, September 2nd, 6 p.m., As Above, So Below. As always, the podcast is brought to you by Crystal Water Float Spa. Remember, go online to crystalwaterfloat.com or go check out their Facebook page at Crystal Water Float Spa. They're located out in Tula, Utah. It's an amazing space to go and flow and lay back and relax and find yourself, find your connection, find that deeper meaning to life. At Crystal Water Float Spa, you get the opportunity to float in the Dream Pod. The Dream Pod is a wonderful tank for floating. It's an incredibly high-end tank. It's one of the best tanks out there on the market. Go to dream-pod.com to learn more about the Dream Pod. When you're ready to get floating and open up your own float center, you can now contact Crystal Water Float Spa and get your Dream Pods shipped directly from the United States. Crystal Water is the nation's only distributor for the Dream Pod. Go find out, learn all about them, and then get your tank, get your float, lay back, relax. Crystalwaterfloat.com, dream-pod.com. Go learn about floating and then go float if you haven't floated. Float, float, float. On today's episode of the podcast, I got the opportunity to sit down with the cast of the Art of the Float podcast. The Art of the Float podcast is hosted by Dylan Calm, Amy Grimes, and Lance Foss. All three of them own their own float centers. Dylan's is in Portland, Amy's is in Nashville, and Lance is from Canada where his float center is located. The three of them put together this podcast a few years ago, and it's a wonderful podcast for people that are up and coming in the industry, looking to open up centers. It helps in regards to all the different frequently asked questions, issues, all that kind of stuff that you're going to come across when you're learning about floating and trying to open up your own space. And these guys host this podcast weekly to help people in the industry, to help people out there in the world learn about the ins and outs of running and operating your own float center. So they do a wonderful, wonderful job with their podcast. And when we were in Portland for the float conference, we got to sit down with all three of them. It was the first time all three of them actually were in person recording a podcast. So it was kind of a wonderful experience and it was a great episode. We had a really good time. You can go find their podcast on iTunes, online at artofthefloat.com. It's on SoundCloud. You can go find it everywhere. And it's a great podcast if you're down for floating if you're opening up a center, if you're just into learning about the industry of floating and all the ins and outs, go find their podcast and give it a listen. We'll, of course, share all that information in the show notes, but sit back and relax and enjoy this episode of the podcast for the universe with the cast and the hosts of the Art of the Float podcast. Here we go. You're listening to the Energy is Love podcast. Energy is love. The Energy is the love podcast. The 
Energy is Love podcast. Energy is Love. The Energy is Love podcast. The podcast for the universe. The Energy is Love podcast. So I'm super excited for everybody. Like it's super, obviously it's amazing for me to have you guys sit down in front of me here <laughs> in Portland at the Float Conference because I've been listening to your guys' podcast for a long time. We already talked ahead of time as far as um, everybody knows who's on the show because mm-hmm. they listen to the intro and everything, but we're going to go through and we're going to introduce ourselves. So Lance, why don't you start? Tell us a little bit about you. Um, I hate that because that's like the generic question that you're not supposed to ask at the beginning of a podcast. <laughs> it's a cop-out. <laughs> but tell us about the Flow Shack. Tell us everything about you and up in Canada. Yeah, uh, my name is Lance Foss. I am from the Float Shack. Um, I'm not from the float shack, sorry. I'm from (laughs) Red Deer, Alberta, Canada, and I operate a flotation center in Red Deer called the Float Shack. Um, We've been open for over two years now, and uh, since then I've also spearheaded a couple projects, which one of them, I'm a co-founder of a nonprofit association called the Canadian Float Collective. And um, we just were out there to try and help unite the flotation industry and get everyone working on the same terms and help bring some some recognition to the industry in uh, the right ways. How long have you guys been open? Um, the Float Shack, we've been open uh, just over two years now. Um, the Float Collective is about a year and a half we've been a uh, nonprofit for. Very, very cool. Mm-hmm. Dylan, you're up, man. Yeah, I own the Float Shop here in Portland, Oregon with my wife, Sandra, and uh, we have a six-month baby on the way, so that's the big thing for me going on at the moment. Is uh, it, will it be your first kid? It's, it's our first. Oh, my yeah, goodness. Which, uh, my world is changing. Like, my yeah. DNA is waking up right now. For and, sure. And, Kids uh, will do that to you. Right? <laughs> like, I, I know I'm just going to turn to mush the minute I meet her. So, um, I mean, honestly, that's that's the number one most important thing going on right now. It, it's crazy. I mean, people talk about how you change, but I had no idea it was going to be like this. Yeah. So. Like for me personally, yeah. leading up to it, you think all these different things. And as soon as you see that kid, as oh soon boy. as that kid's born, the whole world is completely the, different. The, the men traditionally need to be the disciplinarians and, and uh, be able to say no. I don't think that's going to happen. Like Sandra's <laughs> going to have to... <laughs> <laughs> have to take the reins on that one. Yeah. I, so I, I own the float shop with with my wife Sandra and um, started the uh, was called the Art of Floating uh, blog. Um, I want to say 2011. Um, so it had been open for um, maybe, no 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 maybe it was a we opened the float shop in 2011. Sorry, I think the float shop had been open for about a year and a half, and I started. Uh, blogging about running a float center just because I found that um, there weren't a lot of resources out there. There's very limited sources of information and it just felt like the wild, wild west with everybody just trying to um, buy float tanks, drop them into rooms and create a business around it. And we just realized we had learned, my wife and I had learned so much in doing so. We had made honestly so many mistakes doing so. (laughs) It was like, great, there's an opportunity for me to put pen to paper and share that with the world and improve their opening experience. Um, so I did that for quite some time and uh, eventually I got a little burnt out for um, it was right after a, a float conference which was awesome but then there's quite quite the amount of um, uh, kind of kind of crashing after that uh, and that mixed with some some other float industry stuff just had me um, just cashed out just uh, just pooped just really from burned that. out from mm-hmm. the whole thing super burned out uh, uninspired and I, I couldn't put pen to paper I had a really hard time writing for some time and I, I really wanted to get back into it but I found that it was pretty solitary I would write and then I would have my editor Brian Van Pesky go through it and that was fun but um, I, I felt like there could be more to it and unfortunately on my honeymoon <laughs> with my wife uh, it really everything had gelled I mean it had been coming together for some time but it really gelled to uh, do a podcast and 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 that was I mean I love podcasts and it just made sense for that to be the next step for getting this information out there where people people aren't as big into reading anymore and video and, and audio is is more accessible yeah I do that thing where I go and I check on you know I'll click on somebody's blog or find some article and it's like if, if it's not less than like a paragraph right, yeah. or two if I have to scroll too far down then I'm like oh, I gotta I yeah. gotta do something else well <laughs> unfortunately if it's a YouTube video and it's over I don't know 45 seconds I yeah. won't watch it I'm yeah. like I'll click and 
going to be like, how long? No, no, I'm, I'm going to close this out before it even gets my interest. But the podcast, if you like it, if you're interested in it, it just shows up in your queue. You hit play when you're on your drive or, you know, you're cleaning your house or what have you. And it's this really nice passive way to gain information. Audiobooks are something I, I recently started, and that feels very similar to me as well. Although I got to say, the, the audiobooks can feel a little bit dry to me just because I'm so used to the conversations of podcasts and they're, they're so ener- energetic and, and uh, they, they hold my attention more yeah. than, than the uh, Just the that solitary books. person so sitting there. It's funny. Um, but anyway, what I'm trying to get to is that uh, on my honeymoon, I wrote Amy and Lance an email saying, let's do a podcast together. They were my first picks. Uh, I had met Amy years ago and she was... She was hold on. Let's talk about Amy. Please, she I'm sorry. I've been yeah. talking to you. Because I want to hear all about the beginning of oh, the podcast. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm Amy Grimes, and I am from Nashville, Tennessee. And just for the record, Dylan, yeah. I got away with everything with my dad. My dad was the disciplinarian. <laughs> so don't worry. You are just fine. So you can turn out all right. Okay, good to know. <laughs> and I, I still, I, I'm not in jail or anything, so that's good. Uh, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> so you're good. Uh, yeah, I am from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, not originally, but I've lived there for a long time. And we started the Float Center. We're coming up on three years this September. So we made it three years. That feels good. Nice. Uh, and it started all from my first float 20 years ago. It's about 20, 20 years, years ago? It was yeah. 20 years ago in someone's basement. I think the first time we all got together, uh, first <laughs> podcast, we talked about our stories. I think all of us started out floating in someone's basement somewhere. Like those home builds that people whip uh, up. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I lived with chronic pain, and I was at a convention and needed, I thought, massage. I went to this woman's location thinking I was going to get massage. She's like, oh, honey. I can do massage, but I've got this tank in my basement that I think is going to do you so much good. So, you know, when you live with chronic pain, you'll do anything. So I, of course, said, show her. Show me to your basement. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> dark you're a total dungeon. stranger. It's, it's yeah. okay. Nothing this bad can happen. This is Lay back in the tank. Uh, right. There's never been a movie about that. <laughs> oh, no, never. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, for three days in a row, I floated, and it changed everything. And I thought, how am I going to get, I guess I didn't even know. I didn't know there was such a thing as floating. I had no idea. How am I going to get this out? But ever since then, that planted the seed. And here we are, 17 years later, we opened. And (laughs) (laughs) it only took me 17. I'm a slow starter. (laughs) Uh, And uh, here we are today. That's so cool. Um, One of the reasons I was super excited to have you guys on, not just because I'm a fan of the podcast and everything like that, but all the stuff that we do with our podcast you guys kind of hit on little bits and pieces of it. So it was super cool because I love having other podcasters on the show because then you get to talk about podcasting, all that cool shit. <laughs> and then you guys obviously are floaters and you're into floating in the whole industry. And so we love bringing awareness to that. And then if I'm not mistaken, and I'm sitting here looking at all your cool jewelry, Lance, uh, like you got to be a hippie with that stuff on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I love it, you know, because yeah. I'm researching all your guys' stuff. And you're like, Amy, you're like a life coach in a sense with some other aspects of things, licensed massage therapist, all that kind of stuff, right? A teacher, yeah, I do some teaching. See? Yeah. And then uh-huh. Dylan, I mean, meditation, and you guys do yoga at your place. And so you guys hit everything that I love doing with the podcast. That's why it's so exciting. Well, I, I hate to interrupt, but did you have you seen Lance's personal website? Illuminati? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> oh, <is that> <laughs> <not official? laughs> no, no. So if you want to see hippie, okay. <laughs> we'll definitely fix that in post. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or not. So tell me about each of your guys' center. We'll start there with each. Well, actually, let's start with you were telling the story about how the podcast came uh-huh. to be. I want to know more. How did you get, did you guys meet here at the conference? Uh, so Amy and I had met, is it three years ago now? Uh, yeah, uh, no, actually, no, I was at the first first float That's conference. How many stars? We met at the first <laughs> conference, so five years ago. Um, but we didn't five. really connect and talk a lot until uh, four years ago. Okay. So it's been that okay. long. But we, we felt like Float Nashville was like a sister site to yeah. the float shop. We felt a real bond with yeah. Amy and Mark. And and it was, it was really helpful. And something that Sandra and I faced, and maybe I faced it more than Sandra. I, maybe I shouldn't speak for her, but I felt... Uh, I do it for my wife all the time. Okay, so perfect. You're okay. So let me... <laughs> <laughs> um, the idea that uh, Float On was in Portland. We opened up after them. And not only that, but they have this industry, the Float Tank Solutions and this big brand that we felt very overshadowed. And I don't think we would have felt that if we had been in any other part of the country, but because we were the, the kid brother just down the street from, from this famous person or famous business, it, it uh, 
we, we felt the shadow of, of everything we were doing was already done by them. We'd have an idea yeah. and then they were doing it and, and all of that. And, <clears throat> and it was talking with Amy that she was like, you guys are doing something completely different. You need to have pride, and I mean, she wasn't giving me a lecture, but what I took away was I maybe probably she was. was. <laughs> <laughs> you should have pride in what you're doing, and and you are doing things that are different, and some things that are better, and uh, you know, to a particular audience. Yeah. And and uh, she really helped my self esteem, like I, I, being able to pause, get centered, and look at myself outside of this storm, you know, and be able to be a little bit more third person perspective on it. And she helped inspire, I mean, she was the reason I started the blog in the first place. I, there's no way I would have started that without her inspiration and pep talk. So, um, yeah, awesome. so, okay, so if you want more about how we how we started. How did you guys find Lance? Was it just at the conference as well? Oh, we, we just, just needed a third host. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We like threw a rock in the air and it hit him on the head. Yeah. <laughs> Crowded room. Yeah. So it, so it was last year's float conference that I met Lance for the first time. And, and my oh, it was a long time ago you met me for the first time. Oh, it was the second, <laughs> second float conference. Well, you know about branding. You got to see the, the logo a few times before it, before it really sinks in. Yeah. <laughs> so I must have already had a good impression of you. Okay, so yeah, it, it's funny. Things, people remember these things better than I do. But I do remember it was the last conference. We were hanging out at Rogue Brewery after the conference. And uh, um, you came across as very sincere. You had passion. And I think I was picking up on your drive, too, like mm -hmm. that. You have you got a mission, and yeah. that's one thing that by getting to know you better, like uh, through the through just doing the podcast, is, has really come out is that you got the hustle. You want to work all the time. You want to build things, and you want to leave a mark, and which I love. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> I like to work. I always have. So nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had a question in my mind. This was what it was. I had that had that blank moment where you're like, "Shit, I was going to say something." Uh, first off, Lance, I'm going to focus on you because you have really cool necklaces, <laughs> and it's the Energy is Love podcast. Tell me like the <laughs> craziest, hippiest, spiritual thing about you specifically. Like, am, am I mistaken in the sense that you just like cool jewelry, or are you in that kind of realm of that super cool stuff that I'm totally down for? Ah. Uh. I'm into some cool, super cool stuff. Are you? Uh, I mean, are you are you the type of guy that meditates and practices all sorts of stuff all the time? And flow tank, uh, I use the flow tank for most of my meditation. Like that's sort of why I got in here. I could never meditate before. Mm -hmm. I um, my whole life I was I, I'm a mechanic by trade, so my whole life it's I've always been doing something. My hands always doing, 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 and I never knew what it was like to slow down. And um, when I first floated. That was my first time I, I got to slow down. And my first float, I got out, and I couldn't even comprehend that. I was like, what? Like, I don't know. That was, was it a good first float, or was it kind of? There was so much. Yeah. There was so much that happened. I was like, that was, that was just weird, sort of. And I said, I want to do it again. I see the potential here. I really want to explore it. And um, unfortunately, I couldn't explore it without driving for 12 hours, because mm. we drove 12 hours for our first float. And that's how we end up getting a float tank and then further exploring it and expanding that from my basement to our float tank center. But He's the creepy guy with the tank in the basement. <laughs> I think, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all start. We all start there. We all start. Well, I don't think. Did, no, you did no, your. We just visited. Yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> Amy did her first float tank in or her first float in the basement, and so did I. So. Yeah. And I think almost everyone on the CFC did their first float in someone's basement too. So that's where the industry uh, was at the time. That's yeah. where you would float. That's in somebody's basement. And that's why, yeah, that's like I totally I seen the potential of of slowing down and tuning into the internal world or the internal library. But I didn't have it at home. So once I got the float tank and we got the mission that we wanted to start a float center, I got to explore that. And I got to explore the internal world. And I got to work things out. I got to look at this mess of yarn and, you know, detangle it. Just all these knots that have been done. You sort you're of talking just, about all that internal shit, All right? the internal Your brain stuff. And everything the whole like life that. of just constantly being outside and doing stuff around you and never slowing down to listen to the business, the, 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 the mess of the inside world that it can be if you don't deal with that yeah. stuff. So um, that's where the float tank is a powerful tool, and that's where I was able to harness that tool and work through that and sort of start to um, collect a cleaner vision or 
let go of some of that ego and forget about what everyone else says and start focusing on yourself and what makes you happy and you know there's a whole bunch that went on um i don't know what the craziest daisiest hippie thing is but oh i got a follow-up question for you certainly you talk about that benefit of floating for you personally and the way that it allowed you to kind of like you said deconstruct all that stuff that's inside your mind Mm -hmm. and in your life and everything like that Obviously, floating's changed your life because, I mean, you own your shop, you, mm. all those aspects of it. But on a personal level and on that kind of deeper level, do you feel like floating, just specifically floating, the fact that you, not that you own a place, not that you do all this stuff, but you just lay back in that tank, has that changed your life? Are you a different man now than before you floated? Certainly. That is, that is the neutral form of consciousness. So when you are deep in a float with absolutely nothing, that is pure consciousness and nothing more than that. And once you explore pure consciousness, you can then start to explore within that consciousness um, through different means, whether it's meditation outside the tank, learning how to breathe outside the tank, learning how to breathe inside the tank, learning how to um, turn inwards in the mind and learning that there's a lot more than just the self. Yeah. We're, we're all communicating on on unexplainable levels and everything you put out there will somehow come back to you whether it's good or bad you're throwing junk out there junk's coming back at you you're throwing junk thoughts out there without even saying stuff those junk thoughts will somehow come back at you and having to learn that and sort of decipher that and find out how to integrate that into my life is that's that's sort of one of the biggest challenges but learning i should say go going back to learning what consciousness is that was the first thing i guess that the float tank did for me so going into my first float i think that's where it it changed everything like this is this is the pure form that's so awesome and yeah take it took it from there yeah i've I've had a lot of fun as you can see from some jewelry (laughs) and shirts along the way but um it's all yeah See, we tell people all the time, like when we have people that come into our center and everything like that, it's like, if we can just get them in the tank once, if they can just go through that experience once, granted it may suck, but a lot of times, you know, Mm -hmm. it's peaked enough inside of them that they're going to want to come back for more. They're going to want to try it again. And they're going to want to seek out whatever it was, that quiet moment Mm -hmm. in there where they kind of grasped that stuff that you're talking Mm -hmm. about that I call it energy, but (laughs) whatever we want to think about it as. Um, and I'm sure you guys obviously have that experience as well, because it's pretty common throughout the entire industry all over the place. Um, go ahead. What were you saying, Dylan? Just what, what he was saying, like I, everything he was saying felt very similar, but I would word it differently. It was just interesting. It's like, oh, yeah, this is what I experienced in different words. How mm-hmm. fascinating. Yeah. That was fun. And there's a lot of common experiences like that, you know, and it's just that's the beauty for me. That's why I love floating. That's why I love all that crap when it comes to energy work and everything like that. But, Amy, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, you're a licensed massage therapist. I am. So, because there's some people who think that, like, floating is kind of, I, don't, I can't come up with the right word, but we're, you know, floating's going to replace massage. Floating's going to, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. it's it's a good alternative for some people, but do you find that? Have you struggled with that? Or do you find that it incorporates beautifully with each other? Well, I think it's a beautiful combination. I wish everyone could afford to regularly do floating and massage together. Yeah. Um, the reason, well, from a massage therapist's point, of course, when someone gets out of the tank, they're already soft, their muscle tissue is, is pliable. We don't have to go through that warm up stage. I always tell my clients, you get more bang for your buck. If you, you float first, you're going to, you're, therapist is going to be able to get in and do the work that's needed and so you are getting right to the heart of the matter when you're on that table so uh, I find it to be a beautiful combination and that said um, there's a lot of modalities that blend really well I I think floating has a tendency to uh, actually magnify the effects of whatever follows follows it yeah Uh, so I do think it's a powerful one-two combination I know Dylan has acupuncture in his space and I have heard although we don't offer that I've heard from clients who come to us regularly before they go to their acupuncture appointment because they feel Mm. that it affects them much deeper and they have a much more powerful experience with the acupuncture Uh, 
so yeah, it's, it's, it's a great combination. We had a massage space, but I unfortunately got so busy with teaching. My love is teaching. I do teach massage therapists. Uh, so we actually made that into a float room as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but this is the great thing is it's allowed us to go into the community and create relationships with people. And I think that's worked out better because when we had our massage room, it was just me. Um, it was my energy, it was my modality, and that doesn't necessarily resonate with everyone. So now we can go to different massage therapists and direct people to the kind of work that they need. It's not about me and my work, it's about what do you need and let me help you find it so that you can create the most powerful experience for yourself. Beautiful. It's a wonderful collaboration. Yeah, I think so. I think that, like you said, I think there are some people that, because we have um, massage therapists in the community where we live and everything like mm-hmm. that and they're like they're kind of pissed off because we open up a float center and mm-hmm. they think that we're going to have somehow I'm like no it really blends beautifully mm-hmm. it's a really neat thing Dylan do you, you have acupuncture people what else do you guys have at uh, yeah we have uh, four float tanks now we just opened our fourth one recently and we have uh, three massage rooms and we can do four at once if, if we need to uh, which we're working on. Massage is the most recent thing we're really trying to promote and build because uh, the floating is pretty good right now. Uh, we have an acupuncturist who rents a space with us, and so we do cross promotions, and she's under our umbrella, even though she has her own her own business. Uh, we did opened our own yoga, yoga studio a few years ago, and we found that that was a different enough business model that we couldn't manage a float center with massage and acupuncture and all that while also having a yoga studio. We couldn't have put in the energy that was necessary for it. So recently we found an amazing woman, Erica, Erica Belfiore, who owns Zenality Yoga, and she now runs our yoga studio. So it, it is her own deal. And similar to our, we used to have acupuncturists that we had that were truly, I mean, like our employees or contractors. And uh, now we have Marianne who's doing her own thing within our, our walls. Yeah. Um, and then we have two therapists who are also, it's, it's their own business within our walls. And so it, it's, you mean like classic therapists like the, mm-hmm. the, 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 that's very cool. I didn't yeah. realize that. Yep. And, and, uh, it, it's really cool. They have a lot of clients who float with us too. And, uh, it would, what's been interesting to me as far as the therapy goes is it's not like they have a float and then go in for therapy or therapy and then a float right afterwards, like you would with acupuncture float or massage float. But, uh, They'll come in midway through the week, you know, or you know, a, a, they come in on a Monday for the therapy, and then they come in on a Thursday or Friday for their their float. It's really interesting how they the tendency has been they space it out. Yeah, they give time for all that stuff to marinate mm-hmm. from the session, exactly. and then they got to go rinse it off in the tank. <laughs> um, do you practice yoga yourself? I have, but I haven't been recently. It, it's one of the things that's been uh, just killing Sandra and I is the fact that we, we used to live right above the yoga studio. And during that time, I, I did uh, quite a bit of yoga and was loving it. I would feel better. I rock climb or I boulder a lot and it kind of beats up the body, but the yoga just helped me feel so good and the stretching was so nice. But um, that has just fallen off of the map. It, uh, balancing our businesses, the podcast, and uh, I mean, the baby on the way, moving, just all these things. It's funny how self-care goes down the list. It, we just, before the podcast, uh, Amy, Lance, and I were talking, and, and I was talking about how I had a massage recently, but it was the first one in months yeah. that, I, that I've had. Floating, I get in for more consistently, but it's amazing how self-care can drop down when, and I think it's honestly when you're just running your own business, like there's always something to do. And are you taking care of yourself or are you taking care of your business is how your mindset can kind of kind of go to. Well, I'm going to challenge you. Please do. Because mm-hmm. you said your wife was six months, right? Indeed. So the baby's going to be here soon. Mm-hmm. One of the biggest things that I learned, and I'm not standing up on my pulpit because I'm a perfect parent by any means. I've made huge mistakes over the years. I have teenagers and everything. It's a nightmare sometimes. <laughs> but um, Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> they're wonderful when they're little. I enjoy it. And um, I realized part, you know, at some point along the journey of being a parent, uh, kind of regardless of whether you consciously do it from a subconscious standpoint as well, your kids just pick up and absorb absolutely everything that you do. Mm -hmm. And so I now at the point that I'm at in my life, my strive and my purpose and my goal as far as parenting goes is I want to live in such a way that. Um, everything I'm doing, my kids can absorb that mm-hmm. so that they live that way, so that they put the self-love or the self-care at the top of the list mm-hmm. as opposed to let it fall down and yep. all that kind of stuff. So you have the opportunity, new baby on the way, switch it up because she will pick up on 
everything. I believe it. That, that's funny. That's what Sandra and I were just talking about on the way home. I, I believe it was last night. <laughs> uh, it might have been two nights ago, but but that balance and what we're going to demonstrate to her, how important, I mean, we can teach whatever, but how we live is, is yeah. really what's going to be integrated. With yeah, her. you tell them whatever you want, and then you turn <laughs> around and do something else, and yeah. obviously it goes right in one ear and out mm -hmm. the other. Um, I've got another question for all three of you guys, Kay, and we'll answer individually, because I love when you listen to podcasts and you got everybody talking all at once, and it's <laughs> super fun, but then eventually it's like, oh. I can't follow what the hell anybody's saying. Uh, what but, are you saying um, about our podcast? <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys do a pretty good job of it, especially considering that, I mean, before we started, you guys talked, this was the first time you guys have ever sat down in the same room <laughs> yeah, together to be able to record, right? Yeah, and Lance and Amy, this is the first time you guys have even met in person, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Yesterday. So, How cool is that? That's way cool. <laughs> yeah. um, give me the most challenging thing as far as, like, when you first started your center, when you first started into the business of floating, give me the most challenging thing that you didn't necessarily anticipate or that were, you were aware of, and then give me the most rewarding thing that you weren't kind of expecting. So Lance, you go ahead. Um, if you want to think for a minute. No, I'll, I'll, no, I can certainly, there's not much thought into it. It's the sacrifice, <laughs> like the amount of sacrifice um, that it takes to truly start a business from nothing but an idea to writing it, to constructing it, to marketing it, to building it, to making it run efficiently, um, it takes a ton of sacrifice on a personal level. And I knew there'd be sacrifice, but I didn't know the level of sacrifice. So um, that's been sort of unexpected. Yeah. Um, What's the, been the most rewarding? The most thing? rewarding things, hands down, is the finished product. Um, people coming out every day there's people floating in that center every single day and to me that's that's a that's a check mark for success there's yeah. it's helping at least one person every day you know my guess so. is we could probably all agree that that's probably the most rewarding <laughs> thing yeah you can pass yeah. me because that, that's <laughs> basically exactly the same because you get that opportunity to affect and change lives mm -hmm. and help people and that's that's an incredible thing yeah Amy, do you have anything yeah. to add well uh i do use that as my motivation i know that that the work, like Lance was saying, you do sacrifice more than you ever expected. I grew up in a home of entrepreneurs. I've worked really hard my whole life. Uh, I remember a few months ago, my parents came by and they found out I was taking Mondays off. And they're like, you're taking Mondays <laughs> off? You can't take Mondays off, you need to be at your work. Why are you not at your, I mean, it was like, a, you know. So it was expected, I was there seven to 16, 17 hours a day, seven days a week. So I grew up in that atmosphere. But there is a totally, totally different energy and a totally different um, uh, yeah, a different type of sacrifice. You And I think maybe it's because you care so much, because you really, really love those people. And when they don't have a good float, it, feel, it feels personal. It's yeah. not always personal. It feels personal. Uh, but on those days when I'm tired, um, when I think I can't do this anymore, when I'm grouchy, which happens a lot lately. It's, <laughs> <laughs> don't talk to my business partner about that. Um, but all I have to do, if I sit in that lobby and... I wait for the people to come out, everything changes. And even Mark, who's my business partner, will sit and look at me, he's like, your entire countenance has changed. The way that you are standing, the way that you're speaking to people, he's like, everything has changed. That's like the shot in the arm that I need on a daily basis to keep going forward. And it still amazes me how much that energizes me and how much that changes me. I wish I could bottle it up and feel that way 24 7 I'm working towards it but it's it's uh it's a tough road it's a practice yeah it really is and I'm learning that it was interesting that um these gentlemen they were talking about how they came to floating as a spiritual it was a spiritual practice it's been a spiritual practice for you uh when I came to floating it was all about pain management I didn't think about that other portion. I didn't think about that part. But now that I have float tanks available to me, what I've seen in the past three years for myself is it does start to change you. And for me, it's been an exercise in I'm becoming very aware of just how much clutter of my of the the way of the, where my ego gets in the way. Yeah. And so it started a spiritual practice for me that I'm still very unsure of because I don't come from that background. Um, but it's interesting how uh, floating can change you and force you to look at everything differently. Well, give me an idea of like when you're, 
you know, you're expanding your awareness and you're starting to open up to some of these other possibilities and starting to have that self-awareness of, like you said, all the chaos that ensues up in that, in that cranium. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you've started to kind of explore, or look into in regards to expanding that awareness? You know, um, a lot of it, this is a little difficult to talk about. A lot we of it is, no, 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 that's it. okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's like, wow, I, I, I think some of this is the first time I probably said this out loud. Um, but a lot of it is noticing, um, being aware of how much my ego plays into interactions with people and being more aware of how thoughts and, um, Record. I call them recordings that I've had for years yeah, and years yeah, of these tapes. these tapes that keep going on and on, and what my default is. And I'm like, oh, that's not so good. But then the next time you have a situation, you go right back to that default. Um, but at least I figure uh, the way that I try to tell myself now, it's like, well, at least I'm aware of this now. Maybe that is the first step to change. But it is a long, difficult process, and there are some times when I don't want to get into that tank because when I'm in that tank. <laughs> everything becomes you know, now once I get past that first oh, yeah. part mm -hmm. when everything's amplified then it's good but man that first part's really uncomfortable when I have to think about that things when all, when I can't cover up the crap with oh being busy yeah. or yeah. anything else all there is in that tank is me myself and I and it magically I don't know how it does it, it just magically puts you in this very present magic. state it's, it's magic <laughs> it's magic it's magic it's magical, um, <laughs> it really is and for the first time I've experienced being present where I don't care about what's happened I don't care what's going to be but um I think it's the first time I've experienced it. and it's like I want to remember how do I remember this so it's, it's becoming a process for me and it's very it's been very difficult it's been very difficult well we're going to forget about these two guys sitting across from us right now <laughs> And I'm going to give you an idea. I'm going to give you a practice that you can start trying and start implementing. Okay. Because when it comes to that, uh, that because really what it is, is it's the self-talk that we have. Mm -hmm. It's your brain talking to yourself, obviously. Everybody has that internal dialogue. And we do have those tapes. And the vast majority of the time, unless you had like the most perfect childhood, which that person obviously doesn't exist, <laughs> a lot of times those tapes are negative. Mm -hmm. And we spin in that for a very, very long time. So this is the practice for you, okay? okay? You have to sit down, whether you want to do it after a flow, before a flow, that's a wonderful place because then you've got that quiet mind and everything like that. And you want to think very, very clearly. You want to ask yourself, and if you think about going inside and asking your own inner intuition, that kind of soft, still voice that always speaks the truth, ask yourself, what do I really like about myself? And then just listen. And undoubtedly, right off the bat, you're going to have the answer. What do I really like about myself? And honestly, sometimes that answer is nothing. That's the inner, the inner voice, right? That intuition. It's going to, sometimes it whispers, well, you honestly don't really like anything about yourself. That's okay. Like you said, awareness is the biggest key. That's the first step. But then you just have to pick something. It doesn't matter what it is. Maybe you like your eyes. Maybe you like your hair. Maybe you like your laugh. Maybe, and it doesn't have to be physical either. Maybe you have a beautiful heart and you're really kind to people. Just pick one thing. But it has to be a true thing. It has to be something that you feel very strongly about. And then you're going to hold on to that thing. And I tell people all the time, like, write it down, put it on your mirror, put it on a sticky note, stick it everywhere so that you remember that one thing. It kind of becomes your mantra and it just gets ingrained inside your brain. And then every single time you catch yourself in that negative self-talk, because it takes practice to catch yourself in it because it happens so naturally. Mm -hmm. But every time that you catch yourself in it, you stop and then you consciously force yourself to repeat that positive thing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a practice and it takes time and you're going to screw up because everybody screws up, but I don't think of it as screwing up. It's just practice. Mm -hmm. And then you just replace those negative tapes with positive ones. So eventually you get better at the practice and instead of having the negative talk go on for so long, you catch it sooner and sooner and sooner. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it transitions, transitions and changes into positive self-talk because you expand. You don't just leave it with, I have beautiful hair you know, next week or two weeks or a month later, you're adding to it. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can slowly over time through practice, change those tapes, change the default. That's what, that's what it's all about for <laughs> sure. And it is, a, it is a process. Yeah. It's a practice. And, uh, sorry about that. Like I sure hope by any means <laughs> I just had to speak up. I'm glad you this did. It's a beautiful thing. No, that was awesome. Um, Thank you for that. But what do you guys like? Oh, this is what I was going to ask you. You guys have been in the business for quite some time. Do you know how long have you guys been open? Five years. Uh, five years and two months. Five years. And then Lance has been like three years. And then Amy, how long has Flo been there? Three. 
three years. Yeah, we're, we're just over two. Just years. over two years. Where do you guys see the industry going? Where do you guys see it expanding? I know that everybody, like innovation, and we're here at the Float Conference, so we get to check out all the new stuff that everybody's put, putting out, but where do you guys see it going maybe in the next two, three, four, five years? What do you imagine? What do you see? Uh, I definitely see more people floating. Yeah. And I definitely <laughs> see it uh, more readily available. Um, but I also see more people incorporating it as a, a practice. It's it's their healthcare routine, just like people incorporate yoga or basic fitness as their daily practice or weekly practice. They can incorporate the simple act of floating. Yeah. I similarly I see the number of floaters increasing, and I think general awareness and uh, education level of what floating is going up. And part of that is because uh, research is finally happening again around floating. And so we're really going to um, understand that. And I think that will reach the collective consciousness of the different cities around. And I think that's going to be really important. Um, I also feel like yoga had a, a big um, kind of renaissance, or maybe, maybe in its intro had a, a lot of uh, pull because it was about uh, being centered. It was about self care, and I feel like that's kind of gone away it, in a lot of yoga centers where it's about uh, looking toned, looking hot, and it's about yoga pants. It's about how you look in your <laughs> yoga pants. And yeah. honestly, most of the yoga centers a- around where we used to live, they looked great before they ever signed up for yoga. <laughs> and so it's maybe where they get to show off. I, I don't know exactly, but it had. I feel like it had more to do with the ego and image than it did maybe the initial teachings of yoga. And I think floating is maybe another wave of where people, um, those same people or type of person who would have started yoga a while back can have a new outlet of where they can find a place to, to practice presence. Do you guys see any, or can you, um, what about like innovative technology, like sure. incorporating other aspects, expanding on, you know, because th- the fact is we're using the laying back in salt water. You know, obviously people have been doing that for thousands and thousands of years. But where, where are we going to take it in the next five years? How is it going to expand? We, we were talking about this recently, or maybe this was the episode I wasn't there. I think you guys were talking about this. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel, and I'm going to hand it over to you guys, but like, I almost don't want innovation. <laughs> I, less music being piped in, less video, less um, thing, uh, verbal communications going on. I think there can be benefits to it, and I definitely think there are benefits as a business, but I think there's a purity of the float that is, it in and itself has the most value. What about you guys? Yeah, um, I I agree. Uh, the art, the act of floating is a very simple, simple thing. You were totally going to say the art of floating. I d- was. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, I totally was going to. No, you're good. Um, but, but truly, it, it's a very simple thing. And sometimes I think innovation has to happen. Um, and I think it might, uh, innovation might happen as far as how to, you know, the marketing of it, how to spread the word, ways to make the tanks better. Um, I unfortunately am in a state that is bogged down with regulations that are looked at as swimming pools. I like to think that at some point, um, as our equipment gets better, as we, uh, as we upgrade, that perhaps we can get out of, out from underneath that. I think standards are good. Our state went a little crazy, uh, (laughs) to say the least. Um, Bless their hearts, like we say in the South. Um, So I I think innovation to make it better, because there are a lot of problems. The reason why sacrifice seems so big is floating, you you work harder than ever. Uh, There's a lot of issues that aren't solved. We're using pool equipment for heavy salt water. So I think to make those floats better, there'll be innovation in equipment. In fact, we're already starting to see some of that. Um, But I hope the floats remain simple and unchanged because I think that's what we need. There's so much research out there about how silence, how we need silence in a world that is so full of technology and so full of of noise and things that are um, vying for our attention. Um, The, you know, the pure float experience is what we need. That's the cure. Well, maybe not the cure, but it certainly helps with the symptoms of a lot of problems that are being caused by this constant input. So I hope that the float itself remains um, a silent place for to experience presence and to yeah. do that life-changing work. Uh, I think we're just going to see a lot more innovation in equipment and uh, and in education and in growth. Uh, I think I think we are getting ready to explode. I think we're on the uh, on the upside 
of our industry. Yeah, it definitely feels like that. It definitely feels like in the last, you know, probably five to seven years, it just continually has gone upwards. What are you guys each doing as far as, like, do we, do you guys each have plans to expand or what else are you guys going to be adding? How are you going to be doing? Yeah, Lance and Amy, what, what's going on next? I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we have lots of plans, but it comes with lots of, again, back to that sacrifice things, you know, starting something new or expanding. It's it's almost like you're starting back there, yeah. you know, a little more <laughs> sacrifice. So, um, yeah, there's lots of plans. I, I see lots of opportunity in this industry. There's so many pathways that, you know, they could be taken, but they need to be built soon. So mm -hmm. I encourage people to, mm -hmm. you know, think for yourself. And if there's an opportunity even if there is an opportunity, just do it. Do what, what you find most passionate about. If you want to be in this, this industry, you don't just have to be a float center owner. You don't have to be a manufacturer. There are countless other ways you can make a difference in this industry. So You can be a salt guy. You can be a yeah, salt guy. You can, you can, can, you can be better. a filter guy. You yeah. can be a guy that designs uh, the ultimate salt water pump. Like, mm -hmm. there's so many options. And... You know, people, they're starting. I think they're starting yeah. to see because a lot more is, is coming up that are sort of off the manufacturer right. center operator path. Yeah. So. When, when we record, we uh, generally talk for like an hour before we hit the record oh. button. And then like two hours afterwards, it's, it's uh, pretty absurd. But during that time, we have a lot of ideas of what this industry needs. And ideas are pretty easy, but we see a lot of holes in the industry of what... Um, what could be filled. We just need people who are motivated. They need to find it themselves and be passionate about it. They also mm -hmm. need to see like, oh, there's a hole in the industry here. Like th this is, and this is my passion. Like I wanna, I wanna fill that space and, and jump on that opportunity. And as the industry is growing, there's also more and more money to be made too. Uh, I think that's something, I think the three of us don't prioritize a lot in like mm -hmm. how we sell our podcast and stuff, but we all want to make money. Uh, we, now I want to feed my baby girl, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, in the end, that's definitely an aspect of everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, the, and the opportunities are out there, and they're only going to get um, more and more financially valuable as the industry grows. So um, now's the time. Uh, you're, all looking at about this. you're all looking at me. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> no, I got an easy question for oh, you guys. Oh, good. It might Thank not God. be easy, but I got a question for you guys because uh, we've talked in depth about floating, which is great because yeah. we're sitting here at the float conference. Right. We have to plug the float conference. This is my first year here. I absolutely love oh, it. Congratulations. Yeah, wow. I'm having so much fun. It's just absolutely. It's only getting started. Yeah. 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 And this is supposed to be the biggest one yet, yep. right? Like, yep. it's the biggest mm -hmm. one. In the, so, yeah, it's we're super jazzed year. for it. Mm -hmm. But um, it is also the Energy is Love podcast, and so we get to go around the table, and whether you know it or whether you've ever had some sort of inkling, <laughs> we're going to ask each, and each of you guys, what do you think your spirit animal is? Because that's kind of a crazy, weird question, right? It's out there. So whether you've had some sort of, maybe you went and had a, uh, a reading or something like that, and so you have a good idea, or you had a crazy dream, what do you guys think your spirit animal is? Wow. I'm going to go back to Sean Bala because <laughs> they had this wheel. It's just a wooden wheel, and you would spin it to find your spirit animal, and you'd have to go find the little hidden spirit animal throughout the festival ground. And I spun owl twice. You so, spun owl <laughs> twice? Yeah. That's so, a good animal. So um, That's a super good spirit animal I'm, to have. I'm going to ride the, the owl spirit animal yeah so. if you spun it twice then it's a definite yeah like right? that's the universe saying yeah you, why'd you even waste the second spin i told you the first time right. <laughs> that's cool that's a good animal what about you dylan i did have a reading and uh mine was also owl so i find cool. that very interesting oh. what do you know so um you've I just been copying everything <laughs> <laughs> hey, he's first to talk and he's smarter than me so what am i hey, gonna you're do usually, just copy. You, you're usually the first to talk so I, i'm just hey, copying now. you most of the time so i'm the crazy cat lady and i wanted so badly for it to be cat uh in some form um but i worked with a business coach for a long time who is a bit more into the mystical and we worked very hard and uh, on uh not necessarily, we weren't looking for my spirit animal, but through some exercises that we did, uh, he basically had me come up with one. Um, and mine came up as cow. And I was very sad about this <laughs> um, until I'm like, and, and, and I'm like, okay, give me another exercise. Cause certainly what, 
I'm a farm girl. I grew up on a farm. I, what, what's spiritual about a cow? I, I can't say. I want to say owl or cat or something cool. Yeah, it's a lion. But, yeah, there we go. A liger. But a liger. <laughs> yeah, can't that be my spirit animal? But the interesting thing is I did some research on it because it kept coming up, and I was really getting frustrated. Uh, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to go look it up. And there's not even going to be like a cow spirit animal. Uh, but surely enough, there is. Oh, yeah. And I am learning more and more, and I'm understanding now why that was put on my heart. Mm. Uh, so it has to do a lot more with the nurturing and the loving aspect. So, yeah, so I think it might actually, I've been shown it's a cow. That's a good spirit animal. That's <laughs> a good one, yeah. Um, yeah and you have to keep in mind, too, that just because you have one. And I mean, this is my theory. When I say my theory, obviously this is my feelings regarding spirit animals, right? It's kind of crazy. But um, if you have one now, that doesn't mean that it's not going to change. That doesn't mean that it's not going to kind of evolve into something different. And you can have multiple ones. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be stuck with just one. And I always tell people, because I'll do fun things like with my kids and stuff like that, where I'll give them a reading and I'll tell them, you know, whatever their animal may be. and. Uh, it's not like you have to suddenly embrace it so wholeheartedly that you, you know, believe that you're a cow in a past life. It's really just kind of incorporating some of those beliefs or some of the aspects of whatever the spirit animal quality of that animal would be into your daily life. And that's as simple as it is. So what's your spirit animal? I have two right now. Okay. One's a frog. Nice. And then I'm really, really sad because the other one totally spaced me. It's probably because it's, it's probably changed suddenly, just in this moment. You guys are looking at me like, oh my god, this guy's yes. totally nuts. It's an owl too. It was an owl. Yeah. No, but <laughs> frog's a big one for me, and then a wolf. Wolf's always a big mm -hmm. one for me too. But just embrace those qualities. Mm -hmm. They help you throughout life. I had a girlfriend years ago um, who had a cat that it was a very uh, present cat. It was I, I don't know how to describe it other than that. And she had, I uh, was telling me a story about how she had a boyfriend who out on the front porch was yelling at her, putting her his, his finger on her chest, poking at her and yelling at her. And the cat <laughs> ran from the field, it was big farmland, ran through the field, ran up onto the banister of the deck and jumped on his face and scratched, scratched at his face. Yeah. His name was Ozzy and he was the coolest freaking cat ever. I said, if, if you ever move out of state or whatever, please, I want this cat. A bit of a half-hearted <laughs> request. I'm not <laughs> sure if I meant it. But then she moved out of state, and uh, and I got Ozzy. And uh, we had a wonderful life together. He was amazing. He got hit by a car. It totally shook me. We had such a, such a bond. And uh, when we buried him, we went out to my wife now, Sandra's uh, parents' house, and we buried him under under this bush, and a huge owl that had the exact same markings as this cat uh, flew down, sat on a, a, um, a fence post, and just kind of stood over the, the proceedings. It was really amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, afterwards, I mean, it, it had its own meaning to me, and it, it just spoke for itself. But it was amazing that they had never seen an owl there before. Like it, it showed up for this event, which uh, was was pretty special for me. What was kind of the own meaning to you? Like what? Like what was the? Because I listened to that story, I'm like, holy cow, that's amazing. That's mm -hmm. got a lot of profoundness and a lot of really neat things. But what did it really mean to you? Like in the end, what did it kind well, of? What did you take away from it? I think we all have um, connections with our animals, and I think this kind of gave significance to me that this animal also felt that way towards me, and I'm I'm not saying that his spirit was in that owl's uh, body or anything like that, but I felt like there was definitely a correlation there, and and in some way I felt like he was communicating through that owl to me, and, and owl is my, my power animal. There you so go. There some some uh, pretty interesting Maybe Ozzy sent that power animal owl to you, Oof. right? Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. Ozzy is there, and that's, mm -hmm. that's neat. Stuff. It's really good stuff. <laughs> Well, guys, I think that we've done a wonderful job. You guys are amazing. I knew you guys would do great, obviously, before the yeah. podcast. You're sitting down, you guys are going to do awesome. But I really, really appreciate it. And we have to wrap it up because we have a busy freaking day. Yeah, we do. We've got, we got a speech to, to write. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. We are giving a speech in a, an hour here. Yeah. And, and we do have to write it. No, we're <laughs> not joking. <laughs> are we joking? He was not, not joking. But <laughs> <laughs> no. well, thank you so much, thank guys. You. And yeah, usually we you. have everybody throw out all of their stuff, but we'll just throughout the podcast and in the show notes I'll list each an individual shop and everything everywhere everybody can find you guys stuff so Art of the Float right? Art of the Float podcast it's where Float Centers thrive our goal is to reach out to 
specifically to float people starting their businesses, their float centers perfect. or running them. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you so much guys. And everybody enjoy this episode because I know you did obviously and go out and have a wonderful, beautiful day and seek out your spirit animal. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Seek out your spirit animal while you're floating. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, sir. I think there's a purity of the float that is it in and itself has the most value. What do you need? And let me help you find it so that you can create the most powerful experience for yourself. Everything you put out there will somehow come back to you, whether it's good or bad. You're throwing junk out there, junk's coming back at you.